Ryan, introduce yourself. Hey, Ryan Getz. I'm an R2 at the UAB Internal Medicine Program. I'm originally from Northern Kentucky, but uh, went to medical school at the Medical College of Georgia. I'm interested in pulmonary and critical care medicine and uh, hobbies outside of the hospital. Uh, I've got a, do a Boston Terrier named Romulus, who I love taking for walks, and I like hiking. That's great. So I was, we were hoping that uh, Anne-Marie Kumpfer would be able to join us. Can you just uh, say a word or two, Anne-Marie? Did we lose Hi, her? Hi, everyone. My name is Anne-Marie. I am just finished residency in a new hospitalist. I'm actually finishing up my shift right now, but um, able to tune in as well. And so I'm excited to hear what's going on. That's great. And you're at uh, UNC. Mm -hmm. That's correct. She is also an incredible follower. She has, she, she has some of the most uh, thoughtful tweets of anybody that, that I follow. Okay, uh, Charmaine. Oh, hi everyone. My name is Charmaine Chakarcho and I am a former chief president at UCSF soon to be hospitalist at the VA Palo Alto. I'm a team member at CP Solvers and also a big fan of Anne Marie and Uncle Bob and everybody here. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'll try to keep up with all of amazing teaching that'll happen and um, write the teaching points too. And uh uh, the the world famous actually not world famous famous on our floor Alonzo Hudibert the famous Alonzo as he's known around his house I am at all not at all famous um, my name is Alonzo I'm a, a junior faculty at, over at UAB I did my residency at uh, St Louis uh, hashtag shout out Wash U shout out here with us. Um, I stayed there for a chief year, um, and I just finished my very first um, year uh, attending on service at UAB. It's been an absolute blast. Um, anyone who's excited in academic internal medicine, anyone who's thinking about a GIM life, it is amazing. Feel free to shoot me an email with any questions. Um, cannot recommend it anymore. Um, Centaur knows a lot of dirt on me, so please don't ask him. Uh, how old were you when I first met you? I was very little. Hey, were you a wise ass? What? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, used to, he used to trash talk me you just wouldn't believe. And then I had to interview him uh, when he wanted a job. It was great. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, revenge is a dish uh, best served cold. So here's the setup. Are you ready, Austin? Oh, yeah. No. You're on night float. <laughs> Uh, you get a call from the lab that a patient that was checked out to you has a potassium of 6.2. Mm. Uh -oh. So tell me, and you know, you don't know any of these patients. Oh, I didn't get an effective sign out. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. We did not record all the nonsense at the beginning, but, but we are recording it now. And that, uh, that must have been Charmaine who did that. Thank you, Charmaine. It would have been a shame if we didn't record it. Um, okay, so you got, you got an effective uh, sign out, but you, know, you, got <laughs> signed out, you got signed out by five teams. Oh, man. And uh, you got signed out for well, like maybe 80 patients. So you, you don't remember this one. So what I want you to do is think about what information do you want at this time and how are you gonna think about what you wanna do? Okay, so I think my like initial thought is, um, who is this person? Um, and then included in who is this person are, what is their baseline? What is their baseline potassium? And is this like some crazy thing that has happened just now? Um, more backgroundy type things, what did they come here with? Um, are they, um, uh, do they have some sort of like reason to always be hyperkalemic? Um, and I think my number one question is the, is the acute change. I don't know how long you want me to keep talking. I could talk for five seconds or 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, so, so um, I think that's a great first step. So our first step is going to be, you want to know who the patient is. Uh, what, is this their first, was the patient just admitted and the lab just came back? 
so uh, let's get some comments from Ryan as an upper level who's going to uh, help help you think through this. So, Austin, I think you did a really good job of kind of looking at the background and looking at this lab value in the clinical context of the patient. The first thing I typically ask about, though, is whether the lab's hemolyzed or if there was concern for hemolysis, because this could just be a pseudo hyperkalemia. Um, so I always like to look and see if there's hemolysis. Um, I also always ask for an EKG. EKGs are cheap. No one was ever harmed getting an EKG. And it kind of shows you, does this hyperkalemia matter? Mm -hmm. And if you start seeing EKG changes, uh, then you would be more concerned about it. You would kind of go into your treatment pathway, uh, which I'm not sure if that's what we're talking about right now. But um, some, I feel like some changes when you're a night float, um, you have time to think about the hyperkalemia with EKG changes. Mm -hmm. You're kind of looking more at treat first, kind of ask the questions after that. Yeah, I guess, can I, do I, can I have a follow-up question? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess my, my thought with that was that I wouldn't necessarily get an EKG if his prior potassium was six, you know, and, and it's now 6.1. Like, would you, would you still just like, it's not hemolyzed, like go for it? I, I would get an EKG. Um, I know, like, especially I think that someone said in the chat, CKD patients can live with high EKGs. And it might not it might not be anything, but I also don't want to miss hyperkalemia that's causing cardiac changes. Yeah. And so I think that's a very good way of looking at it from a teaching perspective. But you also have to think about being on night float and you have a hundred patients checked out to you. Uh, you. You might not have enough time up front to make all those acute changes. You might be calling back from the while you're seeing a patient in the ER. And so I think kind of having that rapid, this is what we do, and then be able to go back and do your chart review and have a better idea of what's going on is, is an important skill for night float. Okay, so um, we're, we're going we're gonna to work on this, and then we'll get back to the EKG part. So um, comments, uh, since we're fortunate enough to, to, to have Anne-Marie, uh, what what – what advice as, uh, as an attending physician would you give to this team the next morning when they checked out after they did this? Yeah, so I think the first thing is, yeah, definitely the question of, is this real? I think when in doubt, repeat. If it's an out of the blue value that you're not expecting, um, just go ahead and get a stat repeat, um, call the nurse, ask them if they can like get it sent really quickly down to the lab because sometimes, you know, and think about like, could this, what else is running, you know, like, was it drawn from a line where something else is running that could affect it? And so how, how was this drawn? Um, because if it's a sample that's from a line, that would be very different from a sample that's drawn peripherally. So how was it drawn and why was it drawn? Was there concern or was this for something else? Um, and then think about what's the degree because you don't need to treat a potassium like a 5.2 like you do a potassium of um, six. So, you know, how concerned do I need to be about it? Usually kind of my cutoff for being more aggressive is around 5.5, but it kind of depends on the patient and some other factors. Um, and then kind of, as we talked about, you know, is it real? Um, it could be hemolyzed, but also if they have extreme thrombocytosis or, you know, elevated WBC, sometimes that can cause a pseudo two. And then I always look at the med list um, really quickly, say, is there anything on the med list that could be contributing? Because you don't want to like give them all these shifting measures when what if they're getting potassium supplements or they're on something that could be contributing it like an ACE or an ARB or even heparin sometimes can cause a type four RTA. So I try to look at that. Also think about like other things that could be contributing, like do they have an AKI or, you know, why why is this happening? Are, are they having it shifting from intracellular due to being insulin deficient or having rhabdo or something or could, you know, they have adrenal insufficiency. So I kind of try to just like think about everything in context and then also think how concerned do I need to be 
how quickly do I need to act? And do I believe it? Do I want to repeat a value to confirm that it's actually real? Alonzo? I think um, everyone has added so much wonderful stuff. I'm just going to quickly recap. I think um, uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, one of the rules of the house of God at the event of any emergency, the first pulse to take is your own, right? So you get a phone call like this, you're an intern, it's night float. And I remember getting this phone call when I was, when I was first starting out, all of a sudden the palpitation starts. So, um, so you guys are absolutely right in contextualizing this, right? So is this uh, lab value real? Um, uh, was this drawn in an appropriate way? Was it hemolyzed? Was anything else running? Those kinds of things. Um, so I think everyone has said everything that I would do. I would get the EKG. Um, I would repeat the potassium. And then based off those two data points, I would start going into my management. And if you'll permit me for a second, uh, if folks ever forget um, uh, what to look for in an EKG with hyperkalemia, I have something. Slow down. We're, we're not there yet. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. We're not, we're not there. You'll get a chance. So, so he, here's the way I'm thinking about this. And uh, um, the, the, fir the first, the, y'all have done a great job of trying to figure out, is this a real problem? Um, all I did was give you the potassium. I didn't give you the rest of the BMP. And the rest of the BMP is very useful. Um, if, if this is a type four RTA and they have a decreased pi carb, it's probably been going on for a long time. Uh, if, if this is a patient who has a glucose of 600, just got admitted and nobody realized that diabetic ketoacidosis, that's gonna change how we think about it. Um, so uh, I think this, looking at the entire picture, is, is this someone who's been in the hospital for a while or is this someone who just got admitted uh, will change everything. So we, we recheck it, it's still, still 6.2. And let's say in this patient, there's no pseudo -hyper, hyperkalemia. None of the other labs really tell you a whole lot uh, about the patient. Now let, let's talk about the, the uh, EKG situation. So Austin, what are you looking for on the EKG and how important is the EKG if the, if the potassium is 6.2 as opposed to if it's 5.5, .5, as opposed to if it's seven. Oh, so, well, so we, build me out. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, I mean, th th this is, and so this, this, this is, uh, this is called internship prep. <laughs> no, no, it's this, perfect. There's actually, I don't know, if, I'm sure you're, the, the people in the chat have seen it, but there's a beautiful animation that some smart EM person on Twitter has made of the progression of EKG changes for mm -hmm. hyperkalemia where it starts out as these peaked T waves and then it can gradually end up with like sinusoidal waves. Right. Um, it's a beautiful animation. I'm sure someone in the chat can find it. So at 6.2, if you have an abnormal ECG or if you have a normal ECG, is that gonna change what you do? Yeah, I think for my, what I have learned for um, the threshold for calcium gluconate and, and things that are more cardioprotective is that you really initiate those when you see changes to the EKG. Ryan? I agree 100%. I think another important teaching point with the EKG is that the classic progression of the EKG does not have to occur in every patient. Okay. And so if you see any signs on the EKG, it's important to go ahead and treat. Uh, so uh, the EKG changes are somewhat specific. Are they sensitive enough? No. So that's, uh, I, and I think some people in the chat were uh, uh, starting to make that point. Uh, maybe you could, you could uh, say a word or two about that, Charmaine. Um, sure, so uh, absolutely. Um, I think it's never wrong if this is a new hyperkalemia with a like, high severe, let's say like this patient's hyperkalemia was normal and then the next level is 6.2 and 6.2 is never wrong to stabilize the membrane. Thinking about like the downstream side effects, you know, it's all about risk and benefit and the risk of, um, you know, this, uh, uh, this leading to a cardiac arrest it's high, so stabilizing the membrane. And thinking about like the ECG abnormality, the specific uh, signs that you see is peak T-wave usually goes to a 
prolonged PR, and then uh, thinking about um, absence P, the atria, think about them as more sensitive than the ventricle. So you see the absent P first, the PR uh, prolongation, and then it can lead to sinusoidals. And calcium is a great um, uh, thing to give. And uh, I'm not sure if you wanted uh, Uncle Bob to talk a little bit about like how to give calcium, the options available or not, but that's where I would start. Yeah, let's, let, let's, let's do that. So when do we give calcium gluconate and when do we give calcium chloride? Yeah, so calcium chloride, I usually think about it um, for people who have central lines because it can actually cause skin necrosis. So that's not something that you want to give when um, they, you, don't, you only have peripheral access. Uh, calcium gluconate is better um, tolerated. So most often, you know, if you have a patient on the regular ward, they don't have central access, calcium gluconate one to two gram is um, what to reach for. And the most important thing with all of these are trending. So if you stabilize a membrane, giving it once is not enough, especially in the setting of ECG changes. So that's something that you want to uh, repeat. They repeat the ECG often and um, think about other things that you need to do for hyperkalemia as well. Okay. So, but the first thing we're going to do is try to stabilize the membrane. hundred percent. And my, so tell me if I'm correct about this and, and I really want my, uh, uh, the, the troika of hospitalists uh, to, to get this. If, if the patient appears stable, uh, the calcium gluconate for, uh, for a quite elevated uh, potassium, because you don't always have EKG changes before cardiac arrest. If there are really bad signs on the EKG, that's when you put in a central line and consider calcium chloride because you give it faster and it works faster. Is, uh, do I have that right? Because I haven't done this for a long time. So Charmaine thinks so. Alonzo, have you heard that? Yeah, I've been, I've always been kind of a proponent of calcium gluconate. Um, and I think generally on the floor, uh, specifically if we're talking about on the floor, that's, that's kind of what I reach for. And I don't really think about um, um, other forms of calcium unless we're in the unit. So, uh, so I would agree uh, largely. Okay, so you were gonna teach us about the EKG changes. Yeah, oh my God, you guys nailed it out of the park already. But if, for all of us who aren't as smart as you guys, um, a quick thing that always helped me remember, which was something that was handed down to me by my mentor at South Alabama, Dr. Hundley, said, if you're ever trying to memorize the changes that happen in an EKG with hyperkalemia, what he recommends doing is imagine grabbing the T wave at the apex of the T wave, lifting it up and hammering a nail down so you're tacking it there. And then he says, pull on the edge of the wave of the of the waveform and start pulling. And if you imagine that happening in your head, that'll capture almost all the changes you would expect in hyperkalemia, right? So you get the peak T waves, then as you're pulling on the on the string that is the uh, the electrical reading, you'll get a prolonged PR, you'll lose the the P wave, you'll get a prolonged uh, QRS, and eventually you'll lose all kind of morphology. So I don't know, it helps me, but it seems like you guys had it all memorized already. So that might be just for, for folks with bad memories. Yeah, what, what I heard from a resident one time is, imagine fly fishing and catching the T wave and start reeling it in. That's another way to think about it. What's interesting about that is you get, you don't get a prolonged QT, you get a shortened QT. And I think that's because the, the, the T- Sorry, PR, the, my bad. The, you, you get a prolonged PR. No, you didn't say QT, you said it right. Oh. <laughs> but I just want to remind people that Hypokalemia gives you prolonged QT. Hyperkalemia decreases your QT. The other thing, and I was just reading about this today, the other big reason you might give calcium chloride, and someone in the chat mentioned that it's much more potent. Uh, and you can give it by bolus if you have a central line. You cannot give calcium gluconate by, by bolus. Um, is if you have AFib with uh, bradycardia. Mm -hmm. If you have AFib with bradycardia in the presence of hyperkalemia, that's a bad that's a bad risk factor, and you can find you can find that on on the internet. So that's that's sort of an that, that's an interesting thing. Austin, you have a question. I do. I I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions, but um, absolutely anyone can ask questions. <laughs> okay, great, great. So 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 I, I I've learned that the EKG is not super sensitive for uh, bad cardiac changes, and then if we're using that as our measure, ooh, I'm so sorry. 
Um, okay. If we're using that as our measure to give calcium gluconate, um, is there any other way that we can know that we should do some cardio protection? But, so I think it's the level of the hyperkalemia. Yeah. Uh, Anne-Marie, do you agree with that? Did I lose Anne-Marie? I'll agree for Anne-Marie. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, generally, you know, I think of it as a pretty uh, safe thing to give, especially calcium gluconate. So especially if like I'm getting above 6.5, I usually just go ahead and give it because there are very few downsides to it. Gotcha. And so I think that it, that if you have EKG changes, definitely, if the number is big and you believe the number, give it. Okay, so now we've given we've given the calcium gluconate. What what are we going to do to lower the potassium? All we've done now is stable stabilize the membrane, right? Decrease the chance of cardiac arrhythmias. So we're 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 back to our our on call team, Austin and Ryan. Uh, you're really on the spot today, Austin, and you're. you're <laughs> you're doing great. So what do you want to give and why? Um, so I think at this point, we have a lot of options. There's insulin, albuterol, Lasix. There's a whole bunch of things that can decrease the potassium. But I think each of those medications um, is not good in certain clinical situations. So I think now is the point where maybe you need to open the chart and see why this patient has a little bit of hyperkalemia, or at least see what their diagnoses are. Because I'm not trying to like give somebody with in DKA Lasix or, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so why don't we go over each one of those, Ryan? Why don't, why don't you why don't you teach Austin what you know, and then we'll uh, then we'll let uh, Charmaine um, uh, su supervise supervise this uh, as a debriefing the next morning. Sure. So uh, the first thing I think about, we've already stabilized the membrane. Next, I think about shifting the potassium into the cells. There's three main options for that. Typically, the most effective is insulin. Uh, and if you're given insulin, you want to take a look at what the glucose is. Uh, typically, we give about 10 units of IV insulin. And uh, if our glucose is uh, low or normal, uh, we'll give uh, some dextrose, usually D10, with that, um, that bolus of insulin. Um, and then uh, we'll also be checking uh, glucose's to make sure that we're not dropping the patient and any change in mental status at that point, you'd want to check an AccuCheck. Um, next, you would uh, talk about albuterol and this is the higher dose. Uh, I don't recall the exact dose because our hospital has a protocol and you just click the higher dose protocol. Um, but so a continuous albuterol nebulizer and then sodium bicarb is the next treatment. Uh, there's been some studies though that show that uh, like boluses of ampules of sodium bicarb are not as helpful uh, at lowering the potassium. And so there's some thought now in doing like a bicarbonate uh, continuous infusion or drip to uh, shift the potassium into the cell. Uh, next, you think about getting rid of the excreting the potassium um, you kind of have two, two ways of doing, three ways of doing that. You have GI, renal, or when all else fails, dialysis. Um, so thinking about GI first, k was the classic treatment. However, today we use Localma, which I, I apologize for using the brand name. I believe it's sodium zirconium something. Yes, so you're correct. Uh, I think it's sodium zirconium chloride, something like that. I, uh, so that's a good option. And then um, you can also just do lactulose if you don't have access to that. Uh, when you look at like the original studies of K-exalate, uh, they were comparing it to sorbitol and sorbitol was as effective as K-exalate and acutely lowering the uh, potassium. So we've got GI tract. Urine's going to be more effective. Uh, so one of the questions I would ask the patient is, do they make urine? Uh, because if they don't make urine and they're completely ESRD, uh, then given di uh, diuretics is not going to help. Um, and in this situation, usually we're going to go for a higher dose of diuretic. You can think about loops. Uh, you can also do uh, thiazide class diuretics. 
And sometimes you'll hear about people using like fludrocortisone, they even further drop it out, out of the urine. That's not as, not as mainstream. And then um, next we're looking at doing hemodialysis. Charmaine, you're, you're uh, the supervising attending the next morning. They checked out to you. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, does this rock star team need supervisor, Uncle Bob? I'm not sure about that, but uh, Ryan Austin. He, he didn't need beautiful. much supervision when he was an intern, <laughs> let me tell you. No, absolutely. That was, um, that was um, exactly the same way I think through hyperkalemia. So first thing about stabilizing the membrane, then what's fastest? Because it's all about the speed is like shifting it into the cells. And then you have to think about like, okay, there's only two ways for decay to leave the body naturally, right? Urine and GI tract. And the last option is hemodialysis. And um, Ryan, that was an excellent summary of how to do things. Just a couple of pearls to remember. I love that you thought about like whether this patient is in stage renal disease or not, uh, because that just not only informs uh, whether a loop diuretic is an option for them, but also also, when you give insulin and D50, um, you have to check the sugars much longer than a normal person because uh, when you give like that 10 unit of IV insulin, that's going to stay much longer in a patient with end stage renal disease. And I've seen people become very hypoglycemic like seven hours later. Uh, so that's something that I always have a mental check is just to increase my frequency of sugar checks um, in those patients. And Urine usually works a lot better um, than anything through GI tract. That takes like hours and hours up to days to actually work. Uh, so my focus again is uh, usually on loop diuretics. If the patient is like oligouric and they're not um, hypervolemic and you're not worried about it, it's always okay to give them a bolus and give them more loop diuretics uh, as well. The same things that we do with hypercalcemia, for example. Um, so uh, that's another thought to consider in these patients. And uh, like usually if a patient is in stage renal disease or has CKD, I like I will be calling the uh, renal fellow right as I'm getting that hyperkalemia. Usually they can tolerate much lever level, um, higher levels of uh, potassium, but um, there's not, you don't have that many good options to get rid of it. So you're just like shifting it, shifting it, shifting it until they're able to get dialysis. In a patient who doesn't have access, dialysis takes a long time because you have to prep, you have to put the line in. So as much as like we always like put dialysis on, uh, uh, on our list of hyperkalemia in a patient who doesn't already have a uh, line in, it's much more challenging and takes longer to take. Um, the moral of the story with all of these, especially with the solar shift and um, stable potassium is like you need to like uh, be at the bedside and repeat and uh, do this uh, frequently um, until like you actually excrete it out of the body. So, so um, I'm, I'm going to get the, the uh, Troika to respond to this. Um, getting rid of uh, potassium in the GI tract. First of all, there's a third option, which is pteromer, mm -hmm. but they're all slow. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, probably uh, KX late is the most dangerous of those. Um, so that's a long-term solution. That does it, that, that, that is trying to help the patient tomorrow, not help the patient tonight. Uh, so that, I don't think that's as critical a decision. Um, w w would you agree with that, Alonzo? And Anne-Marie? Or did we lose Alonzo? Oh, Alonzo wants to be readmitted. <laughs> Alonzo, you're back. Uh, so, uh, Anne Marie, can you unmute yourself here? Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Okay, great. So, uh, it, when you're on night call, uh, whether you make a decision to give uh, one of the binding resins or not, is not as critical a decision as getting potassium into the cell and uh, giving the calcium to improve uh, the, the membrane potential and decrease the risk of uh, cardiac death. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And if I want to do something that's a little 
longer acting, but also faster. Sometimes I'll give Lasix. And if I think they're euvolemic to dry, I'll give it with fluid to try to do something, not just shift them, but also help um, get the fluid out. So if I'm kind of looking for something faster than through the GI tract, that's sometimes a strategy I'll utilize. Right. And, and uh, I, I think that uh, we, have, we have different sets of patients. We have people who get admitted who uh, with hyperkalemia because they missed their last two dialysis sessions. Uh, we have people who have acute kidney injury and are not making any urine. We have people who are still pl making plenty of urine. And if they're making plenty of urine, taking advantage of that, uh, I think you're uh, really 100% correct. Now, there are a couple of, there are a couple of um, uh, sort of more complicated uh, controversies. So one of the ones that I've seen in the chat, which I think that we ought to dispel right now, is whether you should be giving, if the patient's volume contracted, should be giving uh, saline versus uh, lactated ringers. And people have been, have been scared to give lactated ringers because it has potassium in it. Austin, you're shaking your head. Teach us. It's a myth. It's a myth. It has it, potassium, but it does not raise the potassium. Yeah, how much potassium does it have in a liter? Do you know? No, I don't. So you, your upper level just, Ryan, just, just me. showed me. Oh, four. Four, four milliequivalents <laughs> in a liter. So uh, you're not going to raise the, you're not going to raise it with lactated ringers. So there's no, if, if lactated ringers is indicated for the patient, don't be scared to give lactated ringers. Now, there is some controversy about the use of albuterol. So, Alonzo, do you, uh, uh, are you familiar with that controversy at all? Well, I have to humbly admit that I, I'm, I'm really not, Dr. Bob, so I'm going to let you okay. take, take over. Charmaine or Anne-Marie, does anybody? I'm just not sure it's very... Go ahead, Anne-Marie, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm not sure it's very effective because the amount you have to get give to get a little bit of interest cellular shifting is very very small and so i i think you have to like give like an hour of like high dose continuous nebs or something like that so generally i will not give it unless i'm truly desperate yeah and and i i, I think because you're doing sympathetic stimulation that you have someone who already is already at risk for uh, cardiac arrhythmias. I think there's some concern about that. Um, so I, I've tried to stay away from that. I really like the, the glucose and insulin to drive it into cells. I, I, and, and if the patient happens to have hyperkalemia, that's really your answer. Um, what uh, what other I, sorry would you mind if i summarized really fast because i, I sure. there's so many things okay so if i if i go see this go see this patient with the hyperkalemia before anything i'm going to try the insulin with glucose if i've checked his glucose and that's good and then i'm by the bedside making sure that he makes urine and then insulin then uh, a loop diuretic and then right. on to the more complicated things right uh so uh, one of one of the there's a discussion going on in the chat about whether we should use furosemide or bumetanide. Uh, what? So does anybody know? Uh, any any of our discussants know the difference in the pharmacokinetics of furosemide and bumetanide? So bumetanide is much shorter acting. Um, the question is, is it really faster when you give an IV bolus than furosemide? I, I wasn't aware that, that, that it worked faster. I, I, uh, it, it, does, it does not work as long. Um, and I, even torsemide would work IV. Uh, we're not talking about or, oral uh, loops. So I don't... I, I don't think it's a big deal which, which one we use. Um, we just have to make sure that we're not gonna put the, the patient at risk. The bicarbonate's pretty interesting because if this is a type four RTA, the bicarbonate's gonna help you a whole lot. So being aggressive with the bicarbonate um, 
uh, would be uh, a worthwhile thing to do. So uh, I think that we've probably covered uh, hyperkalemia about uh, more than I've ever heard it covered. <laughs> Does, are there any big questions left in the chat or from the discussants before maybe we can do one, one more quick lab after this, but hyperkalemia is such an important one because it, uh, that's the one that makes you the most nervous. I have a, just a quick thought that um, I'm sorry because I, I crashed down in the middle of this discussion. So if I'm saying something that's already been said, just cut me off, uh, uh, Dr. Centaur. But um, Dr. Guess, I think, did a wonderful job of breaking, breaking up how we manage potassium by physiology, right? So the idea of the intracellular shift being a shell game um, that helps move levels of potassium but not change whole body potassium is an incredibly powerful concept um, that's important to mem remember at all times. Like, for example, the only thing that will keep you um, from starting an insulin drip in DKA is, uh, is a potassium level is too low, right? Because you know that as soon as you give that insulin, you're going to shift the potassium dramatically and cause cardiac arrhythmia. So, so that, that physiologic approach you did, Ryan, was uh, fantastic. And really, Austin, if that, that's, that's the thing I would grab from, from the latter part of this discussion is this kind of physiologic approach to managing potassium. Nice. Okay, Charmaine, what, what, what should we do for our uh, second quick one? Um, hyper, uh, hyperglycemia is always a good one. I feel like that we can do. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, why, why don't you make up the case for uh, Austin real quick? All oh, right. Um, sounds good. So, how's it going, Austin? I'm good. How's I'm this good. night shift treating you? Um, I, I've only had one page so far, so great. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, so let's say, um, you know, you stabilize this patient, and then you're walking out, about to go grab a snack, and you get a, um, a page from a nurse that another patient, um, his finger stick glucose is reading 450. Mm. And he's like, doctor, please advise. 450. Okay, how hungry am I? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> you're, you're an intern on night float. You stay hungry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's my life now. Okay. Um, so 450. Um, uh, I mean, up front, that's not super impressive to me. Um, uh, maybe I should be more scared if someone has an underlying condition, if this is like a brand new thing, um, or if this is someone with ex pre-existing diabetes. Um, um, can I ask the nurse if he already has an insulin regimen? That, um, that's exactly what you should do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. You're, that, you're, that, while you're still on the phone, is this patient diabetic and what are they already getting? Yeah. <laughs> Can we just fix it with that? <laughs> um, okay. Yes, the patient is diabetic. And yes, um, the nurse is not at the computer right now, but there was some insulin regimen that was ordered. Okay, so um, uh, I'll probably check on the insulin regimen that he's, that he's getting and see where his glucoses have been hanging out um, and see if he's on like a moderate or mild insulin sliding scale and see if this is like crazy out of the range. Um, oh, also, my other question for the nurse before we hang up, um, did he have any cookies that you saw? Uh, I had a patient <laughs> last week sneak in a bunch of cookies that he was eating right before the POC glucose. No, you had a patient <laughs> yeah. sneak in cookies? <laughs> and there's no visitors in the hospital. Where did he get the cookies? <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, not that uh, the nurse has been really, their short staff, it's been really busy, but she hasn't noticed anything. Okay. <laughs> Okay, R Ryan. So I want to know if the patient's type one or type two uh, and kind of what the previous finger sticks have been. Uh, the patient's type one, 400 is concerning. If they're type two and are always 400, it's much, much less concerning and maybe even a day team issue if they're already on sliding scale. Um, kind of funny story from when I was on my AI. I had a patient who had just gotten out of the ICU of HHS and the nursing aide gave the patient two bottles of sweet tea and cake. <laughs> and so the patient's glucose was like 400 and everyone freaked out about it, but the patient was fine. 
Okay, so why did you make the distinction between type one and type two? And did you follow Austin first? Did you follow where he's where he's going with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're going to ask you to guess what he's thinking, and then he'll tell you what he's thinking. Um, so at least for the type two diabetics that I've seen, their sugars usually run a little bit high, um, and we're always trying to to tamp down the uh, the sugars with the insulin, but with the type two diabetics, they're a little bit more fragile because we control almost theoretically 100% of their insulin intake. Um, so they're a lot more uh, likely to get uh, problems from the high sugar, like osmolality problems from their high sugars. And I'd be a little bit more worried. And type one uh, are more susceptible. So 400 can be pretty high for type one. And so mm -hmm. therefore we're worried about what? Uh, DK. Right. And so if, if you thought the patient was insulin deficient, then getting the full BMP at that point is going to be helpful if, if they're not insulin dependent. Now, here's, here's the tricky part, um, and maybe you can comment on this, Alonzo. Not everybody who's labeled as type 2 is, uh, just has insulin resistance. Some of them are insulin deficient. Now, Charmaine had told us this patient already had an insulin regimen. But we don't know what that is. We don't know if it's just a uh, the intern didn't want, want to be bothered, and so if the sugar's a little bit high, there's something so they wouldn't get a telephone call. So wh wh what do you uh, what do you think about this? Uh, so it's a great thing you're bringing up, and I think the the big discussion here between DK and HHS is is really important. Um, so I you know I always like to go back to physiology because it helps me kind of think and, uh, and think correctly. And so how, how do ketones form? And, um, and the idea there is when you don't have any intracellular uptake of glucose, you revert to fatty acid metabolism for energy, a byproduct of which is ketosis. So I think what Dr. Bob was, uh, was hinting at is some of our di type two diabetics, uh, after they've been type two long enough, um, actually can burn out their, uh, their pancreas and become um, uh, uh, quote unquote insulin dependent. Um, and these are folks that can actually go into DKA. Um, it's rare, but it happens. Um, and I think that's a little bit of what we're talking about here, right? So the, so the, so, so the, the, the key difference here, if there's, no, uh, if there's no endogenous insulin or no insulin on board in the hospital, there's no intracellular uptake of glucose, which means there's a risk of fatty acid metabolism and ketosis. Um, whereas if you have someone who has uh, kind of a basal production of of insulin, what you're worried about in the hyperglycemia is passage across the blood-brain barrier, osmolar gap differences, um, and and uh, cerebral edema. Mm -hmm. Is and, that what you're getting at, DB? Yeah, yeah and and the other thing about uh, hyperosmolar is it's usually much higher sugar. Absolutely. So, 400 for a true type two diabetic uh, is is much more tolerable than it is for a type one diabetic. Um, and usually you don't get the hyperosmolar until you get seven, eight, 900 or something like that. Um, this is a situation where usually, usually I tell you, go, go, go to the bedside, talk to the patient. No, go to the chart. <laughs> this time you have to go to the chart uh, because you, you, you have to see what's in the chart about as much history as you can about the diabetes uh, before you go to see the patient. Uh, you need to know what they've been taking, whether they seem to be adherent, see what their hemoglobin A1C is, things like that. Uh, and Marie, any, any other comments on, the, on this particular problem? I also just like to take a quick look at their med list and their home med list because sometimes people will get admitted and you know maybe they're concerned and they don't get started on their home regimen and they're way underdosed and then also we're giving them things like steroids and things like that that are worsening. So I think kind of having that context when you go to see the patient is also helpful. Great, great. Is that helpful, Austin? Very. Thank you guys so much. Um, I just have a question. Would would other things on the med list possibly contribute to this? Like, could something yeah. like dexamethasone bring up the sugars that high? 
Yes, absolutely. So if they were just so if you if you if you go to the chart and you find out they were just started on dexamethasone, I can go eat my snack. And they didn't change uh, the insulin they're going to use. You're going to have to you're going to have to do it a little bit differently. Uh, and, and if they're under stress for some reason, uh, could this be uh, could could this be a, uh, a sign of infection? Uh, anything that increases stress can increase your glucose. And so you, you have to think about that. Did they, you know, I always say if someone comes in with uh, DKA or hyperosmolar, make sure they don't have an infection and make sure they don't have an MI. And, they, and it could easily be a silent MI. So keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, Charmaine, anything else to add on this one? Because we're, we're getting down to... Um, yeah. The resolution time, and and we're gonna we're gonna play a little game on resolution. Uh, oh, for sure. Um, the only thing that I would add these days, uh, as Anne Marie mentioned, like looking at the med list, and if they're on SGL two inhibitors, they have a lot of uh, um, they urinate a lot of their glucose, right? So they might go into DKA uh, with much like the euglycemic. Um, uh, you, are you glycemic DKA? So uh, if you see SGL2, then my threshold to get a full BMP, look at the gap, is much lower. Um, so that's one thing to look at. And I also love uh, um, asking your question about medications. I've actually seen people who were well-controlled diabetics, started on steroids, sent out and came, um, came back to the hospital with um, HHS type pictures. So that's something to always remember to adjust the insulin regimen as they leave the hospital on steroids. Right. And the only other thing I'd, men I'd mentioned, because I've seen it a number of times, is we always think about type 1 or type 2 diabetes, but make sure that the patient doesn't have type 3C. So what is type 3C diabetes? So that's pancreatic. That up right now? <laughs> that, no, that's pancreatic diabetes. And so they're, I, I don't get excited about 400 and someone has pancreatic diabetes because they neither have glucagon nor insulin and I'm just trying to keep them alive. Uh, so you, you, the context of who the patient is. So what, what I'd like are five participants who all have done a great job. I'd like you to, to take in the next 30 seconds, write down the two most important messages you want everybody to take home and that you want to take home from this. And if the chat would like to uh, uh, put some things in here, I'll be looking at the chat. Uh, and uh, see if there are things that the chat particularly liked that were useful. And I'd really like to know if the, if the chat uh, thinks that we should do more of this in the future. Okay, so the chat's happy with this. Okay, so uh, Austin, you've been You've been the star all day. Uh, I think you're definitely going to be ready to be an intern. There's no question that uh, you're way ahead of many interns uh, that I've seen already. Um, uh, what are the two biggest things that you got out of this? Um, I think number one, um, it, Brian said so beautifully, is just go for that EKG. Um, I, I think I, I was a little bit hesitant to, to get it. Um, without any information, but I, Ryan made an amazing point that the, the stakes are so high for someone with hyperkalemia complications um, to just go for the EKG um, and see what it says. Um, the second thing, um, I loved uh, Alonzo's point about thinking about the um, correcting hyperkalemia by first um, bringing the um, potassium intracellular and then worry about excreting it um, just so that we can deal with the physiological complications first and then figure out more of a long-term solution next. Great. Ryan? So I think as Alonzo was mentioning, the physiologic approach to hyperkalemia, just thinking through stabilize, shift, and then excrete. And then second, I think uh, the EKG changes. I think it's just important to kind of have those hardwired in your mind. And whenever you see those, even if you're not thinking hyperkalemia, but you see like a wide QRS, uh, they have that in the back of your mind, it might be hyperkalemia. Great. Uh, Charmaine? Um, this is so fun. Thank you for having me. And Ryan, Austin, you all are amazing. And Alonso and Anne-Marie, I've learned a lot from you both. Um, I think like one thing that I always, I try to remember um, 
you know, what we do to the patients. Uh, also, even though for treatment, it has side effects. So if you give that insulin, don't forget to check uh, the glucoses. Um, if there are, uh, you give steroids, don't forget about that hyper, hyperglycemia as a, a cause of it too. So always keep asking the why. Alonzo. Guys, thank you so much for having me uh, come and talk. I had a blast. Um, two big uh, learning points um, uh, for me. One of the things that we didn't really get to in the hyperglycemia that I just have to quickly plug, uh, for me, rule number one, two, and three in correcting hyperglycemia is not to cause hypoglycemia. And I think we were kind of talking about this, but I just want to directly say it. This is why we look and see what kind of doses of insulin um, they've had before that we're not stacking that kind of thing, right? Because uh, hyperglycemia uh, can, uh, can cause a lot of problems, absolutely, um, and in extreme cases can kill. But hypoglycemia is, is, is truly a life-threatening event. Um, the other thing for me, um, it helps me, but just try to remember those, those EKG changes. And if that, uh, if that little memory aid helps you, great. Um, but whatever way you have it down, just make sure to check that EKG. And Anne-Marie, you are the, you're, you are the uh, cleanup hitter. No pressure. So I think my two main points are when in doubt, repeat the lab. And then also just don't forget about the med list. It's important to correct, but a lot of times there's things that need to be adjusted on the med list. Yes. Yeah, so I, you know, it's really interesting. We always talk about when in doubt, go see the patient. Uh, but when you get these calls, when in doubt, go to the chart and then go to the patient. Unless it's a really dangerous number where you want to go and do the EKG yourself. So I'd like to thank everybody. I really uh, appreciate all the, the nice comments in the chat. Uh, they, they went over uh, a number of different things. Um, they like the distinction between calcium gluconate and calcium chloride. Uh, they, they're very interested that we don't have to deal with uh, uh, k exalate anymore, and we, we, could, we could use uh, either uh, zirconium or uh, pteromer. Uh, uh, the dis discussion about uh, lactate ringers, they were, uh, they were pretty excited about. Uh, and I think that the, the fo this format was a big hit. Uh, it seems like people like doing this and uh, we'll, we'll have to do it some more. So I'd just like to thank everybody. If, uh, my, uh, if I could get Charmaine and Alonzo and Anne-Marie to hang around and everybody else get off, uh, I wanna do like a post-mortem with them. And I think we can stop recording now, Charmaine. Sounds great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Bye, y'all.